Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions. And we start with question number one, Rachel Hamilton. Uh, may I uh, draw members' attention to my register of interests, owning a hospitality business, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support hotel businesses. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. A range of business support is available directly to hotels and to other tourism businesses throughout Scotland. The Business Gateway uh, Service offers is a first point of contact for all public sector business support for pre-start, early stage and established businesses. Within the tourism sector, Visit Scotland provides a global marketing platform together with opportunities uh, for their engagement for business development missions uh, and attendance at trade fairs, as well as free market intelligence and advice. Visit Scotland also offers support to individual businesses through their quality assurance schemes and where appropriate hotels may be assisted through direct enterprise agency support from one-to-one -one account management and also skill support is available through the recently launched Scottish Tourism Skill Investment Plan. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Draft revaluations re released on the 6th of December by the Scottish Assessors Association indicate that rateable values for hotels will increase by between 10 and 117 per cent, with initial analysis suggesting an average increase of 48 per cent. This will have a devastating effect on hotel businesses across Scotland who have to pay eye-watering rates. These are labour-intensive businesses with high fixed overheads. They operate on low margins and have highly price-sensitive customers. Hotels are already competing with Airbnb on unequal terms. They've seen cost pressure from wage increases and auto-enrolment. Is it the intention of the Scottish Government to make ho Scottish hotel businesses unsustainable and uncompetitive? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the, the member will be aware that uh, the, the rates assessment are, is conducted by independent assessment, and that's very important that it is independent assessment. But of course, the member will also be aware that uh, during the, the budget, we announced that the current poundage um, that is currently at 48.4 pence in the pound uh, will be reduced to 46.6 pence in the pound. So in those areas where the Scottish Government does have control, uh, we are making efforts to make sure that we reduce um, that burden in terms of the poundage. And of course, if the Conservative Party and its members uh, vote against the budget, they will be voting against this reduction from 48.4 pence to 46.6 pence. Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Rachel Hamilton, a hotel owner, has just asked a question about government support for the hotel industry. This is the 24th time since May that the Tories have asked explicitly self-serving parliamentary questions to advance their own business interests. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that this is a completely inappropriate use of parliamentary time and resources? Yeah, yeah. So that's not a question for the Cabinet Secretary. Question number two, Mark Ruskell. She did declare interest. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to argue the case that Scotland's concerns are taken into account in relation to the Comprehensive Economic Trade Agreement. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, the Scottish Government has made clear to the UK Government and to the European Commission that trade agreements must not adversely affect the delivery of public services or lower standards or limit the Government's right to regulate in the public interest. I wrote to the Secretary of State for International Trade last month, re-emphasising that our ability to regulate and our ability to determine how the NHS in Scotland should operate should in no way be compromised by trade agreements. I have not yet received a response. Regulation of international trade is currently, as a member will know, a reserve matter under the Scotland Act 1998, and trade negotiations are led by the European Commission on behalf of the European Union's 28 member states. The Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament do not therefore have a direct say in or direct influence on negotiations or the ratification of any agreement. Mark Ruskell. Well, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response? And you'll be aware that I've asked over 14 questions now on this topic in recent months. I mean, following the statement that we had to this chamber on Tuesday, perhaps we could get some clarity about CETA and the implications for Scotland. So if Scotland remained a member of both the UK and the European Economic Area, would it be subject to the conditions of CETA in any future trading with Canada? Cabinet Secretary. I think the proposal made by the First Minister in relation to Scotland's place in Europe has a number of questions which we have to seek to get answers to in relation to the interests of other parties. Of course, if it was to be the case that Scotland um, it was to be a, represented by the UK in international trade agreements rather than the EU as currently, then I've heard it said to me, certainly by very senior uh, people in, involved in this, that the UK does not have 
the expertise to properly defend and promote its interests compared to a country like Canada, which has got huge experience, huge numbers of people involved in negotiating trade agreements over many years. And that represents a clear and present danger to the interests of Scotland. So we will keep our eye on this. And of course, we want to promote the best possible interests for Scotland. The optimum outcome, of course, is where we could represent our own interests internationally and make sure that our interests were served in these discussions. Question number three, Ben McPherson. To ask the Scottish Government how its budget will affect the people of Edinburgh. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. We have invested in the Royal Hospital for Sick Children, the NHS Lothian Partnership Centre facilities, which are estimated to be operational in June 2017, and a huge investment in the Queensferry Crossing. The NHS in Lothian will see funding of £1.34 billion in the next financial year alone, and eight newer rebuilt schools in the east of our country will be operational or in construction in 2017-18, benefiting from the £97 million of Scottish Government funding. Schools in the area will benefit directly from their share of almost £7.4 million of the Attainment Scotland Fund and Edinburgh Council will receive over three quarters of a billion pounds through the local government settlement. In addition, over 12,000 businesses in the east of Scotland will save almost £26 million a year through the small business bonus. Presiding officer, there's just some of the positive policies from the budget. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and strongly welcome the Scottish Government's strong commitments to invest in our capital city. With population levels rising in Edinburgh, I also welcome the Scottish Government's commitment in the draft budget to invest £470 million of direct capital investment in affordable housing. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise how Edinburgh specifically will benefit from increased investment in social housing? Derek Mackay. Well, I think that all members will welcome the uh, excellent investment in housing. We have a target of 50,000 affordable homes backed by an investment package of some £3 billion that I think will benefit uh, every part um, of Scotland. 70% of those homes will be for social rent. So having achieved a target of 30,000 homes in the last Parliament, I look forward to this Government delivering a target of 50,000 homes in this Parliament, and that will also include in new innovative uh, financial packages to stimulate a uh, growth right across the sector, and Edinburgh will absolutely be a main beneficiary of these excellent housing policies. Yep. Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I give the opportunity to the Cabinet Secretary to apologise to Edinburgh residents for the budget shambles that we saw last week? The Government had to contact Edinburgh City Council within days of his budget being published to tell it that it had got the numbers wrong. And in fact, allocation to Edinburgh City Council was nine million yes less than the published figures. Does the Cabinet Secretary think this is a competent way of running government finance? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I know that I know that Miles Briggs is new to the chamber, but local government finance is, is incredibly, incredibly complex, incredibly complex. And uh, Miles Briggs might also want to study very closely the evidence I gave to the, his colleagues in the, the Labour Party are trying to heckle me, to yeah. divert me from the answer. But I know that Miles Briggs is a very diligent member uh, of the chamber will want to know the answer. I would encourage him to look at the evidence I gave to the local government committee around local government finance and I've covered every question uh, that was asked. Now he will also be aware that the uh, point of the exercise around the circular is to put out draft figures to engage with local authorities individually and collectively. That is a consultation exercise. That is what we have done and we have delivered those technical arrangements. Miles Briggs' uh, commentary around Edinburgh City Council is not quite accurate in terms of reductions because I'm looking at the figures here uh, for the, well I'll come to the figures Mr Kelly, which shows, shows uh, for the increase for City of Edinburgh Council is an increase of over £10 million. So I, uh, I think the, the citizens of the capital city will look forward to the increased spending power that the council and all local government services have. Because when you look at the totality of the figure, it's not just an increase of £10 million. In fact, it's an increase of over £18 million. Yes. Alec Rowley. Presiding officer, the, the leader of Edinburgh City Council, Andrew Burns, describes the settlement for, for Edinburgh as the worst revenue settlement since devolution. He goes on, and I would like to quote this, he says, rarely in my near 18 years as a local councillor have I seen so much spin and manipulation of figures. And he points out that in Edinburgh's case, they will receive £37 million 
less than they did in last year's budget. Right across Scotland, local government leaders, local government finance directors are warning that we will see deep cuts in public services. Are they all wrong? Cabinet Secretary. Well, if it was the case that local authorities weren't happy with the settlement, why hasn't COSLA rejected the settlement that I have given to them? It's certainly still uh, under our discussions. And, you know, it doesn't surprise me that Alec Rowley is quoting a Labour Council leader to undermine the position of the Scottish Government. But I've just given you the position that the City Council will have extra resources to spend when you look at the total package and when you include the integration authorities, which is the point of integration. The extra resource to Edinburgh area is over £18 million, which is a 2.3% increase to the area. Question number four, Jeremy Balfour. Dying officer, to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to implement the recommendations of the Enabled Scotland report included in the main. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government will consider the recommendations of the Enabled Scotland report included in the main in conjunction with the advisory group for additional support for learning and other key stakeholders. Jeremy Balfour. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer? You will be aware that over 80% of the education workforce who participated in the Enabled National Conversation felt we were not getting it right for every child, with the presumption that all children should be taught in a mainstream setting. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree that in some cases mainstreaming can intensify the feelings of isolation and exclusion felt by some children with a learning disability or physical disability, and that a child's education requirement should be based on the individual needs and background? And does, and does he agree that the time has come for the Scottish Government to review the current guidelines, not just to look at what happens in the classroom, but the whole holistic approach to the whole school day? Cabinet Secretary. I, I, I agree with a lot of the analysis that Mr Balfour has, has set out to Parliament there, that I think we have to make individual judgments about the educational needs of every child. Uh, that is at the heart of the getting it right for every child agenda, and that should be applied in all circumstances. Uh, I'm still a very firm believer in the presumption of mainstreaming, but I wouldn't want that to be perceived as being a view that essentially ruled out the provision in a special educational setting that met the needs of individual young people. So, in principle, I, I, I pretty much agree with the analysis that Mr Balfour has set out. In relation to the wider um, exercise of our responsibilities in respect of additional support for learning, um, ministers have uh, reviewed on a five-yearly basis performance in relation to additional support for learning and I intend to uh, continue to look very closely at these issues, recognising the interest that has been taken in this matter by the Education Committee of Parliament um, and the wider issues that are raised by the uh, ENABLE report. And I will continue that dialogue in the period ahead. Question number five, Alison Harris. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to attract more higher rate taxpayers to Scotland. Sorry, Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. Our income tax proposals for 2017-18 and beyond will ensure Scotland continues to be an attractive place to live, work and do business. Tax is only one side of the balance sheet. By not passing on the Tory tax cut, those on higher incomes benefit from the social contract. <laughs> Free higher education, free personal care, free prescription and other vital public services in Scotland, maintaining Scotland as an attractive place to live and invest. Alison Harris. Thank the Cabinet Secretary. Can the Minister explain why Scotland has seen a decrease of 10,000 higher rate taxpayers over the last year, please? Now, I don't know why it is that the Conservatives are trying to pretend that our tax position going forward has affected uh, the past. I'm happy to look <laughs> at the, the issue in further detail and share it with Alison Harris, who I know, who I know is a former charter, maybe a currently practising chartered accountant. I don't know the position, um, but certainly as a former uh, chartered accountant, will take this matter very seriously. But I would point out that all the predictions that Alison Harris made in the previous debate on taxation have turned out not to be accurate. Question number six, Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you. Um, to ask the Scottish Government when it last met Glasgow City Council and what issues were discussed. Minister Kevin Stewart. 
President, officer, ministers and officials regularly meet representatives of all Scottish local authorities, including Glasgow City Council, to discuss a wide range of issues as part of our commitment to working in partnership with local government to, to improve outcomes for the people of Scotland. Uh, I most recently met the leader of Glasgow, Frank McAviti, on the 1st of December to discuss housing issues. Ivan McKee. I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, the Minister will be aware that Glasgow City Council plans to contract out its ICT services. The Minister will further be aware of concerns raised by the workforce and Unison about the process that has led to this decision, including the fact that it appears to have been taken behind closed doors without a detailed options appraisal business case being published, meaning that the figures for claim savings exist in isolation with no reasonable means of comparison, scrutiny or verification. Does the Minister agree that this is a matter that the Accounts Commission could usefully investigate? Minister. Um, President officer, I'm uh, aware of the concerns that have been expressed uh, around Glasgow City Council's plan for delivery of IT services. Uh, councils are under a legal duty uh, to demonstrate that they are delivering best value for their communities uh, and that they are securing a balance between social, economic uh, and environmental well-being in the way that they operate. Uh, the member is right that auditing all councils' delivery of best value is the responsibility of the Accounts Commission. However, the Commission is independent uh, and so it would be for them to decide whether to look at this particular issue. Uh, as Mr McKee will also know, all local authorities are subject to the freedom of information uh, legislation uh, and must therefore respond to requests for information about their decisions. They are also legally required to provide public access to their meetings and to their minutes and background papers, unless this would be a breach of confidentiality. Question number seven, Linda Fabiani. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how its disability delivery plan will assist people with learning disabilities and people with autism into employment. Minister Jamie Hepburn. A Fair of Scotland for Disabled People sets out a range of actions to support disabled people into work. We will also introduce a one-year transitional service through newly devolved employability programmes from April 2017 for disabled people to provide continuity of service for those, for those who need it most, called Work for Scotland. It will deliver employment support for up to 3,300 disabled people. People with learning disabilities and autism will be eligible for the service. In addition, there is a package of specialist employer support tailored to the needs of the individuals being delivered nationally by the Open Doors Consortium, a partnership made up of Scotland's leading specialist employment providers, Enable, as part of this consortium, who look forward to meeting in the new year. Linda Fabiani. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that? And can I ask him if he's aware of the furnishing service based in East Kilbride, which not only is an accredited living wage employer, but it does work experience schemes with Sanderson High School, which is a special needs senior school in East Kilbride. Um, these work experience programmes have turned out to be beneficial and um, are bringing out the, the great abilities that many people uh, who attend Sanderson High School has. Would he consider visiting the furnishing service and Sanderson High School to see the examples that can be given in a way of encouraging other employers to do likewise in their communities. Minister. What, what I can say to, to Linda Fabian is, of course, that we have in place the Developing the Young Workforce strategy, which is designed to see far better interaction between uh, the school environment and employers right across the country. We're seeing this uh, increasingly. I believe that's, of course, important for all of Scotland's uh, pupils to be able to get better access to the, the labour market, but particularly for those who are furthest removed from the uh, labour market. Uh, so in that regard, I would very much congratulate uh, Sanderson High School uh, and the furnishing service who she's uh, mentioned as a very positive example. I would encourage others in East Cobride, South Lanarkshire and across Scotland to follow that example. Uh, and of course, I'd be very happy to visit uh, the, uh, the Sanderson High School and the furnishing service at some point in the new year. Question eight, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government when the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport last met NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. Uh, ministers and Scottish Government officials regularly meet with representatives of all boards uh, to discuss matters of local importance. Neil Bibby. At, this, at the start of this year, the First Minister promised the people of Inverclyde that services at Inverclyde Royal Hospital were safe. 
This week, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde agreed to hold a formal consultation on the closure of the Inverclyde birthing unit, as well as the birthing unit at the Vale of Leaven. If the Cabinet Secretary will not make good on our Government's pre-election promise and commit to stopping the closure of the birthing unit today, will she at the very least take the opportunity to tell the people in Inverclyde when she will make this very important decision? Cabinet Secretary. As Neil Bibby has just said, the board uh, at its meeting uh, this week uh, agreed that the proposals for uh, Inverclyde and the Vale were to be major service changes. And of course, uh, that means those major service changes will come to me, exactly what the member, I think, has been arguing for all along. So hopefully he will be satisfied that that is the case. Uh, Paul Gray, the Director General for Health and Social Care, uh, has written to uh, the, the Chair of Greater Glasgow and Clyde today uh, to ensure that the terms of the consultation are consistent with the recommendations of the review of maternity and neonatal services, which, as he knows, will be published in the new year and uh, he is reiterating to the chair that it's important that the, the recommendations of that review are understood before the consultation issues on the uh, Inverclyde Royal Hospital and the Vale of Leven. Uh, as I've said before, I'm very happy to keep uh, Neil Bibby and other members updated as uh, these proposals go forward, but I'm sure he will be satisfied that ultimately the decision will be mine. <laughs>